Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, we are the Carbon Brief Food, Land, and Nature team here on the ground in Cali, Colombia, to cover the COP16 uh, UN biodiversity negotiations. My name is Juliana Viglione. I'm Carbon Brief section editor for Food, Land, and Nature. And the way we're going to do this this morning is each of uh, my colleagues and I are going to spend a few minutes uh, sort of introducing the topics that we are covering and that um, the fights that we are looking for, looking out for here in Cali. And then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. So at any point, if you have any questions, please pop them in the Q&A box and we'll try our best to answer as many of them as we can. And just to note that we've been having um, some intermittent Wi-Fi and power issues here. So uh, if we do drop out, my apologies. And uh, we'll try to get back as soon as possible. And um, with that, I'll hand it over to my colleague Orla, who will give a bit of background on the negotiations here and where we are sort of at the beginning of this two week period. Great, thanks Juliana. Um, as she said there, my name is Orla Dwyer. I'm one of Carbon Brief's Food, Land and Nature journalists here in Cali. And as she's already mentioned, we're here for the UN Biodiversity Summit, which takes place every two years. Um, this COP is really about implementation. But if we look back two years ago in Montreal, Canada, that was really about setting ambition for the decade ahead. So that was a, quite a significant biodiversity COP and, and the first one that a lot of people were paying attention to because we were creating and they were creating goals for the next decade ahead of us. And what was agreed at the end of it was a set of goals and targets aiming to halt and reverse biodiversity loss by 2030, um, which, you know, is no small feat, especially because that COP was delayed by a couple of years in itself. And now we're now, you know, almost halfway through this decade. So this COP is really looking at what has happened in those two years since and what countries have done to put these goals and targets in nationally, going from global to national. And I know Daisy will get into more detail on, on the, the national plans and the kind of progress and also lack of progress that countries have made towards putting these national plans in place as we sit here again almost halfway into into this crucial decade um in montreal among the key targets and goals that were put out was to uh, preserve 30 percent of the world's land and 30 percent of the world's oceans by 2030 and a whole host of other issues that were were put in place uh looking forward to 2030 and also to 2050 so there was a huge amount of negotiation ongoing at the time and it was real crunch talks as well. There was they, they also ran over two weeks, the same as this COP. And it was a really in intense negotiating period that I think we're going to see uh, to a similar effect here in Cali, uh, Colombia this year. And this COP as well was not originally intended to be in Colombia. The previous host was announced at the end of the last COP and it was intended to be in Turkey. Um, but they experienced severe earthquakes at the start of last year. And so they postponed it. Um, and then a new host was selected at the end of last year and Cali was selected earlier this year. And I was attending a briefing yesterday with the, the mayor of Cali and he was talking about, you know, countries usually have two years to prepare for this and cities usually have all this time to prepare, whereas Cali had about six months. And he was highlighting that security was the number one concern. Cali has held previous events in the past, but this is among the biggest events that they've held, especially in the conference zone um, where it is being held, which is just outside the city in the kind of industrial uh, center of the city and he was again highlighting the security issues which has been a huge concern leading into this COP um, as Juliana mentioned as time of security we've had power cuts uh, we, we've experienced in our hotel power cuts over the past 12 hours or so in the venue yesterday there was a lot of connectivity issues and I know that's something that Aruna mentioned other countries have raised like the DRC they've had internet issues in the venue which obviously isn't great for transparency and things like that and I know that the mayor also mentioned that the Wi-Fi essentially was set up to accommodate 12,000 people. And there's been about 23,000 people who have registered to this COP, which is bigger than the last COP and also just a significant load on a city of 2.5 million people, um, in, you know, uh, surrounded by rainforest, essentially. So it is a huge, um, a huge load and a huge uh, political and also economic and also just, those, um, yeah, just a lot of a lot of different issues going on at the same time. Um, security wise, then during the summer, a few months ago, a dissident rebel group in Colombia threatened to disrupt the summit and that was later stepped back. But there have still been a lot of security fears. There were, I think, about 13,000 police officers brought in 
from outside of Cali to help do security for the summit. And you can see it around the city, you know, there's police officers everywhere. There's a lot of security outside all the hotels, outside the venue, inside the venue. It's it's very, a lot of security around the place. And that's definitely a, a strong presence going on. And so far, there have been no, as far as we're aware anyway, there have been no major security breaches or anything like that. But there were still fears in the, in the days leading up to the summit with President Petro saying that he was afraid something would happen. And so, yeah, it remains to be seen. We're, we're here on day two at the summit, but there's still a lot of a lot of things going on and there's still a lot of Wi-Fi issues to sort out um, as the negotiations continue. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, hi, so my name is Daisy Dan. I'm Carmen Rees, Associate Editor. I've been following the biodiversity negotiation, negotiations for a few years. I'm going to talk a little bit about something called National Action, um, we are at NBSA, so National Biodiversity Action Plans and Strategies. Um, commonly known as AVSAPs, which are national plans for nature that countries make under the Convention on Biological Diversity. So they're quite similar to the NDCs that you would hear about from the Climate Convention. Um, but the key difference is that MBSAPs are not legally binding and that countries aren't obliged to produce them, they're just encouraged to do so. So at COP15 in Montreal, as part of the global biodiversity framework, countries agreed to come up with new MBSAPs in order to put the sort of targets that were contained within the GVF into action within their own borders. So some of the key targets being protecting 5% of land and, and ocean by 2030 and those kind of targets. Um, so over the past two years, because Montreal was a couple of years ago now, countries have been requested to put these plans forward um, and I've been tracking them, um, alongside Carver, who produced an MVSAP tracker, which you'll be able to find online. And right before the summit, we did a sort of stock take of how many countries have produced MVSAPs alongside The Guardian. And what we found is about 85% of countries did not come forward with a new MVSAP before COP16, which was the request from the document that the country signed off in Montreal. Um, it's worth saying as well that since then, about 11 new countries have come forward with MBSAPs, so we now have about 35 MBSAPs, and we also have about 100 national um, target submissions, which is sort of a, a much more refined, thin down version of MBSAP that countries were encouraged to provide if they were not able to meet the deadline to provide an MBSAP before COP16. Um, so yeah, I'll be happy to answer some more questions about these plans, anything else later on, and I'll pass over to my colleague in the room. One of... Um... The key questions is where is the money for the MBSAPs and putting them in place when they come from. Hi, I'm Aruna Chandrasekhar. I'm also part of the Food, Land and Nature team. I'm based in Mumbai, but very happy to be in Kali. I think the weather is really nice um, and a very well ventilated media room. So even if the internet does drop off, uh, there's a lot going on and it seems uh, quite conducive to outcomes. I've been following two thorny issues um, at uh, COP16 and at the Biodiversity negotiations for a couple of years, um, which is resource mobilization, aka finance, and the other is the fight around on genetic resources, or is called DSI for short. Um, some people like to refer to it as the thorny issue of biopiracy, but finance is definitely going to be, um, and already is one of the key fights, it is the undercurrent um, around all of the negotiations. We've been seeing this already from day one, um, and it's really vital because of the fact that uh, countries uh, did sign off on the GBF, uh, talking about the GBF itself talk, has, a, has a goal to raise 700 billion um, a year by 2030, of which 500 billion is supposed to come from eliminating subsidies uh, that are harmful, whether that's for agriculture, whether that's for industry, uh, which is uh, nature harming. Um, but the other 200 billion year a year is supposed to be raised um, looking at finance coming in from uh, developed and developing countries, looking at historical responsibility. Now, that was um, a, a goal which was set to raise 20 billion, at least 20 billion a year by 2025, um, and at least 30 billion a year by 2030. Now, um, we are months away from 2025, um, and understandably, our uh, developed countries are anxious as to where uh, is the money going to be coming from. Now, there was a landmark fund known as the Global Biodiversity Framework Fund, um, which was set up um, at COP15, but so far that's seen only 244 million, that's coming from seven donors, um, and some of them who haven't paid. And um, at the same time, we're looking at 
how our country is going to be reaching this amount. Our government, uh, we did a piece looking at the state of biodiversity finance um, and what has come in in terms of official development assistance um, and how countries and whether they're doing their fair share in actually putting their money into the fund or at the same time increasing their flows uh, to biodiverse countries like Colombia or uh, and COP15 also did end on an awkward note where um, where the DRC had raised an objection talking about you know how these funds need to be increased and mobilized. Now developing countries are still pushing for a separate fund that is under the governance of the COP. Um, despite uh, a fund existing, they point out that the current fund is temporary um, and that new measures need to be set in place. Now, um, so that is a continuing fight. They're also looking to uh, push for raising further resources. Mm -hmm. And there's also a push towards private finance, which is um, in the GBF, it's mentioned in terms of biodiversity offsets and credits, which we have a piece on. Uh, we're also looking at Colombia, looking at debt for nature swaps. Um, and looking at a various array of uh, different other financial uh, schemes and bonds. But um, it's going to be interesting to see what manages to get tractions. I think the discussions have already gone into contact groups, so that's going to be a very heavily bracketed fight and seeing how those um, resources are progressively increased. Now, the other fight related to finance is on uh, DSI, which both is in the form of a mechanism a um, multilateral, one-of-a-kind mechanism in which uh, countries uh, cooperate and look at, you know, how are these resources, um, how, how is this information shared, how is it, whether it's to be made public, how that coincides with national le legislation around sharing access and benefits that are derived from genetic resources or based on DSI. Uh, for instance, this could be taken from a plant. Um, that DNA could be used to create uh, synthetic products which gain revenue in millions, whether it's like uh, life-saving drugs or we are talking about beauty products. Uh, but how do those benefits uh, trickle or go back to ecosystems and communities where they are derived from and how this is distributed, what that money is spent on, whether that's conservation and sustainable use or whether that's something like development. Um, and those are the kinds of fights that are ongoing. There is a global fund that is connected to it. Um, and those are also questions around, you know, should those contributions be voluntary? Should they be legally binding? Um, should industry be asked to contribute? Um, again, should that be binding or um, should academia be asked to contribute? And to what nature are we talking about open access versus at the same time um, respecting the rights of communities um, and ensuring that they have a fair say in uh, the use of these resources? So yeah, it's going to be um, one of the most tense fights. Some of those rules are going to be that fine print is going to be um, negotiated here at COP16 and finalized. Um, and right now there are just way, way, way many um, options on the table. So we're seeing some of the more. Um, and yeah, uh, that is going to be one of the clinches of uh, COP16. Yeah. Um, and now our uh, our other food, land and nature reporter, Yanine Quiroz, is going to speak a little bit about uh, what she'll be following and indigenous rights uh, and the indigenous presence here at COP16. Of course. Thanks, Juliana. Yes, so um, I will be following uh, some key issues as well as, um, yeah, like things that are happening around um, the COP. So one of these issues is um, indigenous peoples and local communities' rights. Um, what we know is that currently indigenous peoples uh, conserve around 80% of biodiversity worldwide. So its role is very important to conserve and restore nature. And they are uh, key players in these talks. So um, I had the opportunity to, ask, uh, to attend a press briefing uh, with this um, kind of caucus that represents indigenous peoples uh, from all over the world. And uh, what they say is that um, one of the key demands or priorities for indigenous peoples is to um, kind of deliver or agree on a work program and a work group 
to implement um, the Article 8J, which is an article that is embedded in, in the uh, in, in the Convention on Bio Biological Diversity. So um, this article is crucial for them because um, it's related to the recognition of their knowledge, their traditional knowledge, to uh, better preserve uh, their ecosystems and wildlife. So um, they are demanding also, for example, um, more access and new financial mechanisms for them to really um, implement the GBF within their territories. And um, yeah, that's basically what they are looking for. And also they are very interested in having like a say on digital sequence information because um, they will be affected uh, by probably new developments or new products that um, comes up for, from these um, technologies and scientific advances. So they, they are um, asking for representation within these um, uh, discussions on this matter. Um, and well, the other thing that I'll be focusing on uh, while covering the COP will be um, things related to how to enact the GBF, like in terms of means of implementation, not only, well, Aruna is going to, for example, is going to focus on um, biodiversity finance, and I'll be looking at how countries, how parties need to um, develop their capacity building to really um, kind of be able to share the knowledge, uh, the traditional knowledge, but also the scientific knowledge to uh, carry out these um, conservation programs. Um, so what is uh, happening in, at, at the negotiations is that there will be um, discussions on how to, um, yeah, like how to implement a um, technical and scientific support center for all the regions in the world. So people like traditional people, uh, also civil society and the society in general have access to this uh, knowledge and technologies and the scientific information to better protect the planet. So that's it for me. Great, thank you, Yanin. Um, and just to add that one of the key things that I'll be following here in Cali is the negotiations around the monitoring framework. So this is sort of how countries can measure their progress against the targets and goals of the global biodiversity framework. So a monitoring framework was agreed in Montreal, but they also agreed to revisit it at this COP. And so there will be some sort of key negotiations there around specific measurements and indicators, such as uh, pesticides and how, um, how countries should measure their progress against the pesticide risk reduction target. But then there's also sort of a larger question around um, how prescriptive the monitoring framework is and how, how flexible it can be and how countries can adapt it to their own um, national, uh, their own circumstances. Yes, thank you. Um, their national circumstances and also, uh, you know, it's very closely tied in, of course, to the um, finance question and how countries can can get the resources they need to um, to do all this measuring and monitoring. Uh, so with that, we'll open it up for questions. Uh, 40 minutes for questions, so please, um, I see some are coming in already, but continue to drop them in the, uh, the Q&A box. And um, maybe we'll start out uh, with a question about um, business and uh, nature positive outcomes. So this question is, uh, was emailed to us and it says, a recent article in Bloomberg Green 
points out that there is no clarity among financial institutions on how to support the delivery of nature positive outcomes. One challenge is the measurement of biodiversity, which is geography dependent and much more complement, complicated than carbon mitigation, which can be measured by a single metric. How can progress be made in this area? And what should we expect from COP16 and subsequent negotiations in the next few years? So, um, do you want to split that up? I guess, yeah. Uh, would anyone like to take on um, part of that? I think especially it's it, it you're right in terms of the fact that nature doesn't translate easily to metrics and I think that's you know one of the things about diversity right um the fact that you it um and in terms of the reasons why either a species declines or how it recovers and we're seeing this especially around the challenges um in biodiversity offsets as well as credits in terms of okay well can you offset damage? How can it recover elsewhere? Um, how um, something that takes place because of an intervention, is it a small period of time? Because again, species, we're talking about much longer time scales than just in terms of emissions. Um, and I think it's uh, especially challenging uh, to kind of um, put that or to measure, and I think especially developing, now there are issues around the indicators that we are talking about as well, right? What, um, and it's challenging because you need to be able to have both um, an investment in conservation science, you need to be able to um, have enough data to be able to collect all of that. Um, and for that, you also do need resources that are in place. And we are seeing that in terms of countries saying that, yes, if you want us to collect indicators on all of these things, we are also dealing with other um, financials as well as other constraints to be able to put that in place. Now for businesses, um, and that is another challenge because it's easy, it might be to be able to say that, okay, well, this is a certified and where is, you know, a certification around looking at offsets as well as credits and being able to do that. But actually monitoring of whether that does actually realize, I mean, result in what is being called as nature positive. Some countries are even pushing back against the term nature positive. I think Brazil is one of them. Um, they feel that it is perhaps a net zero equivalent, but also at the same time, what does the term really mean? So I think before we, um, before that is a, becomes a more widely accepted term, it needs to be unpacked as in, can it translate um, to the sort of um, easy successes? And it is a challenge, there is no easy answer to that, I feel. Juliana? Yeah, so that, that really ties in closely to the, the sort of issues around the monitoring framework and just the question of how do you measure biodiversity. Um, so I think what we can expect to see from this monitoring framework is we've got sort of different levels of indicators. So there's headline indicators, which are, um, for example, the 30 by 30 target, presenting or preserving 30% of the world's land and oceans by 2030. That's something that's very, um, that's quite straightforward, I'll say, maybe not easy, but straightforward to measure and calculate your progress against versus something like the target on indigenous inclusion, which is very, you know, equally important, but much harder to sort of quantify. So for those uh, more qualitative targets, they're developing a series of binary indicators. So these are basically a list of yes or no questions that um, that countries can answer as to uh, sort of how they're making progress um, against those uh, qualitative targets. And then they, they've bro broken these down further into um, component and complementary indicators. And this is where that sort of flexibility and national circumstance comes in. Um, so countries can sort of use um, existing data sets and existing indicators from say the uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals to sort of complement those headline indicators and say, you know, these are, you know, maybe we're making really good progress in preserving forest area specifically, um, but not our marshes and wetlands. Um, just on the back of that, I think one thing that is 
easy and that has been measured is nature negative um, and nature negative subsidies in particular. And that especially is something concerning both uh, businesses as well as the public sector and how much states are providing. There was a state of finance for nature a report by the UNEP, which estimated 7 trillion in nature negative or nature harming subsidies. And we can clearly see what that is. So in being able to um, see what progress has been made, because in the previous decade, which is the IG targets, action on reducing harmful subsidies was pitifully low. So what are we going to be able to see this decade from both from businesses as well as from uh, governments? And that uh, is a metric, I think um, that's quite easy to track, both in terms of policy and otherwise. Yeah, I also wanted to add something uh, to the monitoring framework. Uh, so indigenous peoples are also asking for the inclusion of um, headline indicators on the recognition of the lands. So this is very important for them because they are they have been like asking this for a long time. So for them, it's, it's like a crucial opportunity to uh, really see like what they, what they are asking, you know? like their, their recognition of their legal um, ownership of the lands. You know? So that's, that, that would be interesting to see how governments are going to uh, report on that recognition. Thanks, Janine. Um, another question that's just come in. Is there any sense that countries are seeing biodiversity as a national good and a buffer against climate change impacts, nature as an adaptation or resilience measure, rather than something that needs to be paid for, uh, rather than something that needs to be paid for? Um, Daisy, maybe you'd like to answer this? Yeah, sure. So um, at the COP28 climate summit in Dubai, there was the kind of first real high level engagement on seeing climate change and biodiversity loss as kind of twin issues and join inseparable issues. So then um, a number of countries, I think it was like more than a dozen countries issued a joint statement for climate and biodiversity. And that contained a kind of statement on recognizing the science showing that those these two problems are linked and that there of course are some areas where biodiversity can be um, managed to help tackle climate change and also that uh, when biodiversity is um, harmed it can also harm efforts to tackle climate change so those things were recognized there and I think yeah it was a big moment to have ministers sit down and discuss these two issues as one issue for the first time and here in Cali there's going to be more discussions on a kind of negotiations level about how climate change and biodiversity can be more joined up and um, more linked together. More widely, um, for the past few years, there have been calls from certain camps, including the former UN biodiversity chief, Elizabeth Remen Maruma, to com actually combine the UN Biodiversity Convention and the UN Climate Convention. So when um, the Rio Convention came about in the 1990s, they, they decided to make separate negotiations for climate change and for biodiversity loss. Um, but some people think because the biodiversity loss negotiations received much less high level attention in terms of um, global leaders attending and in terms of coverage and global media, that kind of thing, that there has been a call to maybe combine it with the climate summit so that these two issues can be addressed as one. But of course, like there are also other parties that say that this wouldn't be possible, it wouldn't be feasible, it would involve a lot of change, a lot of work. And there have been criticisms of the climate um, convention process as well. So yeah, on, your question. Just on the paying for part of it, um, the OECD mentions that a lot of uh, climate finance projects where um, where biodiversity is not um, stated as enough as a significant objective, whereas for biodiversity finance, a lot of the projects are stating climate as a significant objective. So um, it is also looking, I mean, it is up to, to the climate community to look at biodiversity as something that um, needs to be um, also significantly financed, even though it is encapsulated in nature-based solutions and so on. Um, yeah. Just quickly as well, on the interlinkages you mentioned, um, I know Susanna Mohammed told Reuters, she's the environment minister here in Colombia and also the president of COP16. She told Reuters a couple of weeks ago that 
she would like to see basically a combined submission to the, the three Rio conventions. So the climate change COP, the biodiversity COP and the desertification COP, kind of highlighting the, the burden that it has on developing countries in particular to have to put forward these three different submissions that are linked in different ways, but that these links aren't highlighted and that they're treated as three separate issues. And when I was speaking to Astrid Shoemaker, the, the head of the Convention on Biological Diversity, a couple of weeks ago, I was asking her about this and, and she kind of didn't, um, didn't say kind of either way which she would prefer, but it is definitely a discussion that's ongoing here, I think, is these interlinkages between climate change and biodiversity loss in particular at that higher level and also on a national level, uh, particularly for developing countries, I think. Um, we received a question on uh, animal agriculture as a driver of deforestation and degradation of ecosystems. And the question is sort of, to what extent has tackling these impacts on nature uh, been sidelined at the COP by vested business interests, uh, lobbyists, and politicians. Are there any positive signs that the synergies between tackling them and climate change mitigation is gaining momentum and urgency against the COP delegates? Or yeah, would you yeah. like to? Yeah, I can take that one. Um, agriculture is definitely discussed at biodiversity COPs and in intensive agriculture as well, to that degree. Um, at COP15 in Montreal, in previous drafts of the final global biodiversity framework, which was the, the big agreement that came out of that COP, agriculture had more mentions in it, um, specifically around targets like harmful subsidies, for example. Agriculture was one of the sectors that was specifically called out, um, but that, that did not make it into the, the final draft, as far as I remember. Um, but it was included in other terms. I think the sustainable management of agriculture was highlighted in, in the final agreement. And but as you can see, that it was mentioned in previous drafts and then removed agriculture is a huge issue, like it's a huge sector in so many countries and also among some of the most biodiverse countries in the world. So your Colombia, Brazil, India, like a whole, a whole lot of other countries that have a huge amount of biodiversity and also have huge agriculture sectors. And those, those two things are, they have to be managed together. And that is something that I think is discussed a lot here. Um, and in terms of the vested interests, I mean, it remains to be seen, we'll have to see at the end of this COP how agriculture is talked about, especially side events. So I think we'll all be trying to go to different side events while we're here. And I'll be looking at some of the ones around agriculture. And it is something that other outlets are, are looking at as well. Um, so yeah, it is definitely a topic that is discussed here. But similar to the climate COP, it is sometimes sidelined um, among other issues. Okay. Um, sorry, I've just seen someone uh, is asking if Aruna can repeat what will be the biggest fight on the finance agenda as the audio cut out a bit while you were speaking? I mean, I was saying that finance is going to be one of the big, biggest fights. Um, and of course, it is in terms of how has progress been made. Um, and I think countries are also pushing for a review of all of the finance, all financial flows so far. Um, towards biodiversity um, and for that to be on the table um, I think the COP17 um, to see how countries are performing in terms of hitting that 20 billion considering the you know the, the deadline is 2025 is not very far away um, and also what is the action that is being taken on um, things such as subsidies or other sorts of policies for, for raising that amount of finance. Um, and, well, and the push for a separate fund, because they argue that the Global Biodiversity Framework Fund um, is temporary in, in that in the sense that it's on till 2030. They would also like uh, for this to be under the governance of the COP, where parties have a, a say in terms of how this is done. Um, so yeah, there is that. And there are others who push for maybe the framework fund is fine for now, but we strengthen policies around it. Um, and look at how allocations are being done. So yeah, I, right now resource mobilization is um, one of those key fights. Great. Um, we've got a question on biodiversity and human health. So it says, what can we expect to see on the topic of biodiversity and human health at COP16? In your view, is bringing the topic of human health into the conversation helpful, or does it distract from wider conversations around nature? Um, I know you're following that a bit. Would you want to speak to that? Yeah, of course. Um, so yeah, that's one of the issues I'll be looking at here is the interlinkages between biodiversity and health, um, human health, but also animal health and planetary health and everything around that. Um, so we are expecting to see an outcome on the global action plan on biodiversity and health. 
which it has been worked on for the past few years and at previous COPs as well, where countries are trying to agree on, on this text that essentially is looking at how countries can better integrate these linkages between biodiversity and health into their own like national policies and into local policies even and, and just to better integrate these issues into their other plans and there was a the latest draft of that I believe was published a few months ago and countries were asked to um, send in their submissions and their, their thoughts on what was said in this prior to this and so I, I had a look at those and they're included in our who wants what tracker, which you can, you can find on Carbon Brief's website, where we looked at all the different negotiating issues like DSI and finance and also the, the biodiversity and health uh, global action plan. And so you can see where countries stand on some of those key issues as of pre-COP. And it's definitely something I'll be following closely over the next couple of weeks. And yeah, again, we're, we're expecting to see an outcome, but many things can change over the course of the COP. So we'll, we'll find out in two weeks. Yeah, and I'll just add that there's sort of a wider question at the at the CBD and in these negotiations as to sort of what falls under the purview of the convention and does health uh, is health under the convention or should that be sort of treated elsewhere um, and there's also links with what Aruna was talking about with DSI and um, access to and benefit sharing from genetic resources there's currently negotiations at the World Health Organization around a pandemic treaty um, where that is sort of the central fight. So even though that's not an explicit thing being dis discussed here, certainly there's there's very close linkages um, between the fights being had uh, at the CBD and elsewhere. Uh, uh, let's see, there's, um, a question, to what extent are mega diverse countries central to the negotiations in Cali? I can imagine, for example, from the perspective of efficiency of their preservation measures. Does anyone want to speak to that? I would say pretty essential. <laughs> <laughs> we are in a mega diverse country. Um, also, then you have um, Brazil leading a coalition of 20 mega diverse countries. Um, and Brazil was one of uh, countries that put forward both the proposal for a new fund for pushing back on, um, for especially of looking at issues such as nature positive of um, questions around how access and benefit sharing should happen. Um, and I think both um, this group, um, which also has overlaps with the African countries, uh, the African group of countries, um, they have a, a quite a strong voice here. And I mean, as you know, as repositories of the world's biological diversity, um, their say is 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 quite um, strong as well as loud, and I think um, is getting amplified. Um, so yeah. Well. I can add that, for example, this at this COP, I see like a different vibe. Huh? Like when you uh, enter the venue, see like different people from um, like many, many regions, especially Afro-descendant peoples. Um, so I think that this might be a good uh, signal to, um, to really see a huge and a greater participation of these uh, people that uh, sometimes doesn't have or don't have like access to these conferences. So I think that this is a positive uh, sign and maybe we can uh, expect um, a greater participation from them. Also the Colombian presidency was yes. uh, yeah, like kind of boosting this um, participation of people uh, from Colombia, from Latin America, and especially indigenous peoples. So, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it nice is. to see that the, I mean, both the the location, the presidency, um, and of course that it's not happening at the CBD's uh, seat or secretariat, which is in in Montreal, um, and we are <laughs> surrounded by some of this biodiversity might lead to outcomes that, um, you know, are moved towards, um, yeah, to what megadiverse countries are hoping to see. Yeah, 
there, um, that's a nice segue into uh, this question about the participation of the U.S. Uh, the U.S. is a mega diverse country, but it is not part of the like minded mega diverse uh, negotiating group. And it's one of only two governments, along with the, uh, the Holy See or the government of the Vatican, to not have ratified the treaty. So this question is, why has the U.S. not ratified the CBD treaty and how does this affect the negotiations overall? Um, the U.S. was, uh, I believe, a big proponent of the Rio conventions and sort of getting those negotiated, but uh, ratifying a treaty has to be done by a majority, a supermajority in the Senate, and um, there's just not uh, the political will um, or coherence in the U.S. to sort of pass a treaty that was seen as potentially infringing on U.S. interests. Um, so uh, the US, U.S. did not ratify the CBD um, when it was written in the early 90s. And as far as I know, and as far as Astrid Shoemaker knows, uh, there's no sort of conversation about uh, them doing so. But they they do have a presence at the, um, at the COP. They are... There is a U.S. delegation. There are lots of U.S. Um, interests represented, academics and, and otherwise, um, but I would say have a much smaller role in the, the formal negotiations uh, because we're not part of the treaty. I was going to yeah. say, yeah, it was just what I, again, like you mentioned, we asked, I asked Astrid Shoemaker about that, the, the head of the Convention on Biological Diversity, when I was speaking to her a couple of weeks ago, just out of curiosity, just thinking again, the election, the election in the US is happening in, in just a couple of weeks and whether uh, a new president would change the fact that the US hasn't ratified it. And she essentially said no. <laughs> essentially that there was no, as, as far as she was aware, there was no discussions ongoing about it. There, there's no discussions with any potential new presidents. And under Biden, there has also been no discussions as far as she's aware on this topic, but that she was saying there is a lot of dialogue between the Convention on Biological Diversity and also the US, especially because they're based in Canada, so they're, they're not that far away from, from the US. Um, and again, like you were saying, there was a lot of participation, but I think that's where it does differ quite significantly from the climate cops, where like the US is one of the huge major players in the negotiating room, and that's just not the case here. It's here where it's like Brazil and it's all the, the mega diverse countries that have a lot of the negotiating power here. Yeah, and although it is outside the negotiating rooms, uh, some would say it has a, a lot of influence on what's happening in, um, given um, also the fact that U.S. interests, whether it's industry. Now, in terms of um, it's doing its fair share, um, a report from ODI estimates that if the U.S. were to contribute and, and do its fair share um, on biodiversity finance, it would have an $11 billion shortfall of this 20 billion target um, and its risk or responsibility on or uh, towards contributing to biodiversity loss and depletion um, is staggering. Um, so maybe there's a um, strong reason there to sit out because you're also talking about, we're seeing that in climate finance and its role. Um, so yeah, maybe there is a, I mean, it has reasons to sit on the sidelines. Um, but at the same time, it is an influential player, despite being on the sidelines. And the U.S. is not signatory um, or not has not ratified the um, BPNJ treaty as well, which concerns biodiversity beyond national jurisdictions. So, yeah, it's interesting to see uh, the conventions, which um, uh, the U.S. is sitting out on. Um, but, yeah, it means that it's missing out um, on some bits of this. Yeah. To be fair, only about eight countries have ratified yeah, the BBN yeah, agreement yeah, so yeah, far, which exactly. was agreed um, yeah. last year. Yeah. Um, we've gotten a few questions on sort of attention to the COP and participation. Um, so I'll read this one says, why do you think we are seeing business and world leaders attend in larger numbers at COP 16? Um, then we are expecting to see at COP 28 this year, we can also say, why are we expecting more attention than at there was at COP15 or at previous COPs. Um, Daisy, would you like to speak to that a bit? Yeah, sure. Um, I think it's not actually true that there will be more world leaders here than at COP28 Climate Summit in Azerbaijan. Um, but in terms of attention at COP16 compared to COP15 and compared to COP28, I think that um, 
a massive part of the reason is Colombia's presence um, in climate and biodiversity negotiations. So at the COP28 Climate Summit in Dubai, Colombia came forward with a pledge to end new fossil fuels and that and it was the first major sort of fossil fuel producing country to do so. So that really caught people's attention. Susanna Mohammed, the Environment Minister of Colombia, who is also the COP16 president, is uh, has been described by many publications as a rising star in the global environment movement. And she's certainly very captivating and very involved in many areas of climate and biodiversity. Um, so I think her like position at the helm, alongside Colombia being a mega diverse country, um, has helped raise the profile of the summit. Also, additionally, COP30, uh, the climate summit being held next year, is going to be held in Brazil. And a lot of people are making links between what we're calling COP60 to COP30. So we're talking about two Latin American big environmental negotiations. And when people talk about that, I guess they are kind of skirting over COP28 in Azerbaijan happening in um, November. I guess as well, probably separately, the COP28 climate summit in um, Azerbaijan has um, been embroiled in various kind of um, criticisms about Azerbaijan's role as a, as a fossil fuel producer and Azerbaijan's um, uh, history with Armenia. And so those issues have also sort of played a part in COP28 not being as big as um, some climate summits are. But it's worth saying, I saw a very good reporter called Joe Lowe say this on LinkedIn yesterday, that even though COP28 in Azerbaijan will not be as big as um, the Dubai summit, it's COP29, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've been so many so many <laughs> Sorry. Believe everything I just said, but just at changes to COP29 yeah. in your brain. But yeah, the reason that even though COP29 won't be as big as COP28 or potentially COP27, it's still so much bigger than the climate cops were even five years ago in terms of high level participation and attendance. So it's worth pairing that in mind. Yeah. I just wanted to add that considering we're talking about uh, DSI rules, that's something that has industry um, quite interested um, and that will have implications for, um, for pharmaceuticals, for again, looking at everything with the beauty industry. So you have industry that's quite um, invested in what's going on um, and also academia, because this will also have um, implications for questions around open access, whether um, journals might, or academia might have to contribute. So you, there is a lot of interest that's in, and we are, which is why we're seeing pretty high turnout um, and interest from uh, these groups. Um, see, uh, we've had a few questions on sort of biodiversity credits, biodiversity offsets. Um, Will they play a role here? Co-benefits with carbon credits. Um, Arun, I know this is your passion. Uh, would you like to sort of speak to um, sort of what we're expecting to see on biodiversity credits slash offsets and maybe what the difference is? Because it is my passion, I wrote a really long explainer for Carbon Brief, um, which uh, details some of both the concerns as well as how countries are um, moving towards uh, setting up various kinds of, of markets. Um, of course, the idea of if you set up national laws around or means to regulate, um, you have the them being packaged as credits instead of offsets. What does that really mean? Um, now, the idea of offsets means the idea that you're offsetting damage, right? It's induced with a particular project uh, harming orangutan species, um, and how do you offset that damage elsewhere? And now, what are the sort of metrics that you use to say, that, okay, how many species? Do we know how much is going to be harmed in the process? So there's a lot of tricky calculations, both around metrics in terms of damage. Can you really offset it? Can you have credits that are just without damage, um, that preclude, that are just voluntary, that companies just buy. Um, but at the same time, you've been seeing, um, of course, the EU, the UK, um, France um, are pushing towards or setting up uh, biodiversity credit markets, as well as um, incorporating that into, let's say, biodiversity, a policy known as net gain, um, and sort of having that push towards it. 
as um, a means of looking at major positive outcomes. Um, and at the same time, we're seeing that going to be in a very large focus here at COP16. I think there are a couple of those markets that might be launched at this very summit. So keep your eyes out for updates from us. Um, and yeah, um, but at the same time, we're seeing huge amounts of pushback from um, civil society, from indigenous communities who are raising quite similar concerns to what uh, were raised around carbon offsets, carbon credits, and markets, uh, where they're talking about human rights safeguards, where they're talking about questions of additionality, of integrity, of um, whether this is how are you going to measure actual benefits, um, and you know whether these, how will these credits hold um, at a time where we are seeing um, huge amounts of biodiversity loss. So that's we're going to. I think there will be both protests. We have also seen petitions as well as letters that have been. Um, uh, highlighting this, but at the same time, you have countries um, keen on making that differentiation between offsets and credits and those that don't see the difference. Thanks. Um, we've got a few questions on maybe sort of zooming out a little bit on how negotiations work and how the CBD works in general. Um, I'm not sure if anyone knows the answer to this one, but why is the biodiversity COP hosted only every two years compared to every year for the climate COP? Does anyone? I feel like people have asked me this question before and I've been like, I'd love to know the answer. But... And it feels like something I've even looked up before. Yeah. <laughs> for, like it just feels like something that was maybe just agreed at the time because maybe they didn't expect it to be required every two years. Or sorry, every year. But I have no idea. Yeah, the, um, the other was Rio convention, the... Uh, the Convention to Combat Desertification is also also meets only every two years. So very confusingly, in about a month and a half, there will be another COP16, but that's the UNCCD COP16. But to say there is also a lot of, in two years is in that period in between, there is a lot of intersessional work and a lot of um, time for different working groups to go out, um, try and figure out and resolve, uh, or at least to get around to, or to try mm -hmm. to discuss particularly tricky issues. We've seen the ad hoc uh, open-ended working group on the SI, um, and also on resource mobilization, there was another committee that was set up to review some of these things. So yeah, you have more options, you more have time for more draft decisions, put this in place, but then also you might just have a lot of stuff that is in brackets, which will need parties to sign off. And eventually, um, push comes to shove. It is always down to the line at COPS, so. Yeah. Um, maybe a little bit of a procedural question. Can you talk us through a typical negotiation? Who is in the room? What are the formalities? Um, and also another question of just how does it work inside a COP? I can talk about the second one. Um, right in uh, in terms of the venue, I mean the that's just talking about biodiversity cops, and I only have this one and the last one to compare to. But at least in this cop in Cali, you register in advance. You go in, you get your you get your badge. Uh, so we all have our, our press and media badges. And yesterday morning, there is often a lot of chaos in the first couple of days of a cop. Um, so even yesterday morning. It took uh, Juliana and I about two and a half hours to get to the actual venue and we had to get buses. We were following Bolivian negotiators around the streets trying to figure out where a bus stop was. <laughs> and it, because we were in, we were definitely encouraged uh, by the COP presidency to get buses over taxis. But the, the buses were all very crowded and also it's, it's very hot here. It's around, I'd say, almost 30 degrees at the moment at around 10 a.m. And you're under the beating sun queuing to get into a conference room. So the, the first couple of days are always definitely chaotic and it is the same in the climate cops. Once you do get access to the venue, there's often there's always an airport style security because the, the blue zone, which is where the negotiations happen, is run by the UN effectively. And so there is basically airport security style to get into the venue. And there's a lot of security guards around, a lot of police officers. And it's it's a mix of the behind the scenes negotiation rooms, which are often behind closed doors and which uh, Aruna would often be sitting with her ear cocked, I'm sure, and the rest of us are trying to get into. And then there's other open um, negotiation rooms as well. And then there's the media center. There's also a lot of events happening as well. There's a lot of side event uh, locations. 
There's buildings for different countries and different organizations too. They have their own kind of pavilions. Um, it's a bit, I'm from Ireland, so this is an Irish specific comparison, but I remember the first cup I went to, I compared it to the plowing championships. So if anyone understands that uh, reference, <laughs> is that, but it is basically a big, it is a convention. You know, there are, if, if you're from a business, you could come here and just use it as a networking opportunity to talk to other businesses. Like it really depends on the person who's coming to the cop and what they get from it. But this cop in particular, as everyone was already saying, is a lot more open air. There's beautiful views of mountains. There's a national park nearby. It's a lot more scenic than your average cop, which is usually inside closed rooms, harsh lighting. Uh, yeah, very intense situation. But yeah, the first question, someone else might be able to speak more. On the, in how the talks are informed by the science, I think that was part of the question. Oh, yeah. Um, so yes, these talks are informed by the science. So, so the biodiversity talks are informed by an expert panel of biodiversity scientists, which is known as IMBES. So it's Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity Ecosystem, Ecosystem Services. Um, and you may be more familiar with the panel of experts that inform the climate summits, which are known as the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC. So it best was formed a fair bit later than IPCC, so they have far fewer reports, um, sort of assessment reports, but they still have produced a landmark report that has been, um, it was signed off by countries, so every country um, has to agree to what's in the summary for policymakers for these big reports, and they also are referenced at summits, so we wouldn't have a cover text from a biodiversity negotiations, but in the climate negotiations, you would see um, governments recognizing the urgency of climate science from the IPCC in cover text. So in sort of the main agreements that come out of the summits, and also here, you would just see it best science being referenced and being used by negotiators. So that's kind of how experts here know about how bad climate change is or how bad biodiversity loss is. They are being informed by an expert panel from around the world. And um, the there's one sort of sub agenda item on the negotiations here uh, about IFBES and sort of what the COP where the COP wants them to go next. So they've agreed they agreed some COPs ago to produce a certain number of assessment reports, and uh, at this COP they'll be deciding on the theme of the of the last of these sort of fast tracked assessment reports, and so. Some options that I've uh, seen come up are biodiversity and poverty, biodiversity in and cities, um, biodiversity and pollution, and biodiversity and climate change. Uh, yep. Sorry, uh, just to add in uh, on like how the negotiations take place, I had a chance to attend a workshop for journalists for uh, for Latin American journalists. And then they explain us like um, that inside the official negotiating rooms, what we see is like, um, yeah, representatives of governments, for example, from uh, ministers of um, energy, of economy, uh, of the different um, structures of government, uh, they, what they do is like they discuss and they agree on the different decisions that needs to be taken. And also like in the very first days of the conference, um, so like the negotiate negotiations are more tense, like more conflictive, like very technical. And as we move uh, towards the end of the conference, um, like all of the decisions and all of the agreements uh, become exactly like more straight, straightforward for parties and they are able to communicate to the public or to the press. So I think that's how the flow of the negotiation go through. Yeah. I would, uh, <laughs> as a, uh, yeah, so. Oh, I was just going to say, there's sort of a, a cascade of decision making or of negotiation. So there's the, the plenary, which has to come together and um, come to consensus on everything. The plenary is divided into two working groups, working group one and working group two, which each have their own sort of agenda items they're negotiating. If for the trickier negotiating items, 
Those will be broken down into contact groups, which are smaller groups focused on a single agenda item. So yesterday they broke out into a contact group on DSI, a contact group on resource mobilization. There were others, but I can't remember them off the top of my head. Um, and then if those are still struggling, they break down even further into uh, informal informals or inf infs, uh, which is not any easier to say. Um, and so they then they sort of try to come to consensus like in those smaller groups and then build back up uh, to the plenary. Yeah, and I think one of those things to keep in mind, which is again, the issues of access, right? Um, the sooner you break into contact groups into informal informals, that means civil society is out of the room, right? Um, in terms of who has access as media, you're there for the press conferences. When uh, things are hitting the line, that's when countries might be like, you know what, we might want to speak to the press. Um, and put pressure on um, and say, say a little bit about what's going on. Um, otherwise, it can be you might have small periods of lags where everything is really tense and you don't know what's really coming out of things. I think here as well, in terms of um, at the CBD, observers have a much greater role and often have more access, but we're seeing that getting a bit more closed, um, which means, again, uh, people with interests as well as um, organizations as well as indigenous groups or gender groups are going to be sitting on the sidelines and have as little of an idea of what's going on um, as compared to media. So I think that's um, when it's it is usually the case around um, extremely heated issues, um, but we are seeing that um, breaking into contact groups for a variety of different subjects. So yeah, um, we're just putting your ears uh, well to the walls. Um, and of course the observers were playing um, really um, uh, important roles in letting us know what's going on on the insights. So yeah, um, yeah, so it's gonna be. Uh, the breaking down into smaller and smaller groups also puts a big strain on um, countries that have sent smaller delegations because they, maybe can't be in all the rooms at the same time. And that's yeah. an issue that is has been raised at every COP that yeah. I've been at, biodiversity or climate. I think all of this just kind of highlights how difficult it is <laughs> to follow these things on a daily basis, especially uh, for people not here in person or for people trying to follow it from abroad or even from outside the blue zone. And I think it is really like highlights how helpful what we do at Harvard that you've been having a big piece, which we'll be publishing at the end of COP, which is basically breaking down every single thing that has happened uh, from last week until the end of, of next week. And just kind of, it's, it's a really hard thing. A lot of, it's a lot of moving parts, a lot of things can change and the text can change like significantly from the start of the COP to the end. And so I think it's a really hard thing to track on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's kind of almost easier at the end to get a big digest of what, what has happened. I would disagree in terms of the fact that um, it's super hard to track remotely, but there are definitely bits, which is of course, try and follow the plenary um, or, or the ministerial dialogues, which are there on the UN um, CBD channel. But at the same time, it is super tricky um, and we have a text tracker. So in case you are interested in really getting mm -hmm. into those weeds, which is counting, we count the brackets for you. Thank you, Juliana and Dr. Verna, who've come up with that tracker so that you can see how either conflict is getting resolved, how countries are um, dealing with issues and how that's, um, yeah, uh, that, that's moving along any new papers that come out um, with the con consensus or with draft decisions that look um, like compromises have been made. So it's uh, if you wanted to do that sleuthing work, go for it. Otherwise, we are here with this amazing team to um, yeah get you to the, that particular point. All right. Thank you, everyone, so much for joining us. Uh, sorry we've kept you three minutes over. We just are all so passionate about the CBD that we can't stop talking about it. Um, so please uh, reach out if you have any further questions and um, keep following uh, co uh, Carbon Brief and the CBD. And um, yeah, thanks again. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye.